Professor Vishweshwaran, the guest speaker on this occasion. I don't think he needs any introduction. He has served the department for I think over two decades. He was the principal of Arts College, Dean Faculty of uh, Arts. He was also responsible for setting up the Communication and Journalism Department in the University of Hyderabad. That's uh, where Professor Balaswami was a student uh, of the MA program. Then uh, <coughs> afterwards, I think uh, Professor Visheshwarao guided him for his PhD. Okay, I just take a break. I think Radha Kishore, MLA, who happens to be Professor Balaswami's scholar, has arrived. May I request him to come on to the guys, please? Of honor, I would uh, love to invite Kishore, but uh, since Professor Vishweshanav has another engagement after this uh, speech, I request Professor Vishweshanav, please bear with us, uh, Mr. Kishore, for a while. Okay. So, I know Professor Vishweshanav is very eloquent. Okay. He can continue for uh, an hour or so if we just give him that liberty, but uh, so again, request him to maybe. <laughs> We agree so that we have other speakers who will also address. Uh, thank you very much. I hope power will be restored so that uh, we can see each other peacefully. Thank you. Distinguished uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Ravindra. Professor Ganesh, the principal of the college, Professor Stevenson, head of the department, Professor Nageshwar, and Mr. Kishore, who is an MLA from this region. I never thought uh, that uh, I will be in a situation where I have to, as uh, Professor Ravindra put it very aptly, that you know, a teacher will, you know, will be in a situation where they will have to deliver a memorial lecture for a student. Uh, but it's unfortunate, as uh, they have said, it's a reality. It's happened. I have a very, very long association with uh, Professor Balaswami. I'm in the University of Hyderabad uh, almost about 30 years ago. After we had an entrance exam, we came for the interview. Those days we used to have interviews for selecting students. I was already head of the department and a dean of the school. I found them uh, as a young person with a lot of talent and imagination and that's how one of my, I, I identified him and gave admission to the MA program and later they continued with me for several years to, to complete his uh, PhD with me and then I played a fairly an important role in terms of you know, getting a job and then coming back to Osmania University because he thought you know, that he should be here contributing to one of the major universities in this country called Osmania University. It is sad that you know I and several people I meet. In fact, there was another memorial lecture which was held you know in Vijayawada a couple of days ago where I sent a message. I couldn't go, but then several people who you know were associated with him students, faculty, friends in the media, a very, very fond memories uh, of Professor Balaswami. It's unfortunate that he's no longer with us. And I think, you know, to perpetuate his memory, perpetuate his thinking, his perspective, his ideological framework, you know, we are having, you know, this uh, first memorial lecture. I will just take about, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to float some ideas which all of us are concerned about in this country. I think it's important in academic institutions we have to raise concerns and issues of this country, particularly in the field of journalism. We have to have an understanding about you know, the contemporary narrative which is going on in India. 
And my dear young friends, when you look at the context of India is mind-boggling today. The context of India is very, very disturbing in the country. In my classes in journalism, I used to say that, you know, to sensitize, you know, students when they join a course in the first semester, as long as they don't understand society, as long as they don't understand the context of this country, in terms of its concerns, in terms of its issues, you will never become a good journalist. So I think, you know, it is important for us to examine that context today. We are at a point of time where all institutions in this country have completely become defunct and collapsed. I'm saying this with all consciousness. When you look at you know, one of the major institutions in this country called legislature, whether it is here in Telangana, whether it is you know, in the rest of the country, particularly when you take you know, Lok Sabha and many other institutions of that nature, rest of the country. When you look at you know, legislature as an institution, 40% of the people have a dubious record, a criminal record, not according to me, according to Parliament Secretariat itself, you know, they have. Forty of them have you know, that kind of a record. And another 15 or 20 percent of them are totally cut off from reality of this country. They are richest of the rich in this country, representing, you know, and sitting in the Indian Parliament, or for that matter, you know, several legislatures in this country. And one of the major institutions in this country, we are one of the largest democracies in this country, 75 years of old democracy, but this major institution called legislature is not functioning. You know about even a major public policy document called the budget is not discussed in the Indian parliament. And we all of us know about what happened to the three form bills, you know, which were not even discussed you know, properly in Rajya Sabha, but then they have a bulldozed majority and then you know, the bills are passed. So that is a major crisis we are going, you know, and a body, a lawmaking body, and now an institution called legislature, which is going to be making laws for this country. Many of the lawmakers, you know, or lawbreakers in this country, they do not have, you know, the right kind of a framework or the background to represent all of us. The second major institution called the judiciary. I do not have time. That's why I'm now cutting it short to put it in a nutshell. The major institutions in this country called the judiciary. According to the latest uh, Washington Post editorial discussing about you know, the judiciary in this country, they said it will take 425 years in this country to, set, to settle the present litigation. I'm not talking about you know, the litigation which is likely to come up. Okay? And only recently the Supreme Court Chief Justice also said one of the major litigants in this country is, is the government and there are you know, several judgments you know, which are given by the Supreme Courts and High Courts the governments are not implementing. Justice delayed is justice denied. But it will take about 420. I do not believe in second janma. You know, if someone believes in second janma, they will have to take you know, two or three janmas to see that you know, the Supreme Court decision, you know, judgment comes from the Supreme Court. Another reason, Supreme Court is a highly questionable kind of an institution. We know about corruption in the Supreme Court. All of you know about Prashant Bhushan said, you know, 30% of the judges in this country are corrupt. And we have seen what happened to uh, what the Supreme Court said, you know, ultimately because they did not want to take that case to a logical end, they fined, you know, Prashant Bhushan one rupee. Because otherwise, you know, Prashant Bhushan would have gone ahead with his case and he would have given evidence about who are the judges in this country who are uh, corrupt. One aspect is, you know, the, the number of cases which are pending. Another aspect, you know, is the kind of a judges, you know, we have in this country. Then executive is one of the major institutions. I don't want to talk much about it. But one of the major hopes in this country, when we talk about, you know, the three institutions, you know, going back into history, during the emergency also, we had at least, you know, a couple of papers, a couple of journalists, independent editors, you know, could fought, could fight the emergency. But we do not have, you know, any longer, you know, such a situation. So when you look at, you know, the major institutions called Parliament, Executive, Judiciary, and another fourth pillar of Indian democracy called the media, which I will talk about in a little while from now, is also in a big question mark. Institution like Central Bureau of Investigation, institution like Election Commission, institution like Enforcement Directorate, Central Vigilance Commission, all of these institutions have completely collapsed. And then what is the role of the media when these institutions are 
collapsing the role of the media is to comment the role of the media is to give an editorial opinion the role of the media is to set an agenda as we keep talking about in the classroom set a political agenda social agenda economic agenda or you know if not anything you know simply talk about what is there in the constitution all these constitution values in this country are completely being decimated the idea of india itself i'm making an important point the idea of india itself is in a good question mark the idea of india talks about no plurality the idea of india talks about diversity secularism justice social and economic and political justice as the preamble of the constitution says liberty and equality and then you know the bigger question is the rule of law very blatantly today i used to say earlier that you know we need to understand caste to understand india i am now saying you know not only we need to understand caste we also need to understand cow to understand india politics of cow has become very very important in that kind of a sense you know some of them are saying perhaps you know india will head towards a hindu rashtra but we are already in a hindu rashtra that is the reality let me give you a brief narrative about what's been happening in this country since 2013 and 2014 i think it's important the role of the mass media is to highlight you know these issues what are the major concerns i've just made a list of about you know 10 or 15 issues which are very very important where the media has to highlight look at you know the lynching of the muslims and the dalits the nature of narrative which is there in the indian media assassination of rationalist intellectuals in this country which has happened about you know 5 years ago we do not have any kind of an evidence you know how you know they have been assassinated the trolling of scholars in this country there nothing called you no know, academic freedom in india universities do not have that kind of a freedom particularly i'm talking about the central universities they have given us the mandate to you know what is the nature of research you know, which has to go on and the detention of activists the harassment of you know certain celebrities and movie stars the defamation of the opposition the destruction of the economy i don't have to talk about it all of you know what's happening to indian economy and then you know completely persecution of the minorities in this country and then complete destruction of you know this fundamental rights which are there in india and then completely destroying gutting of the public sector i'm using that word gutting of the public sector we have seen what is happening to lic in the last you know 48 hours and then and then targeting of non governmental organizations silencing of civil society the distortion of history rewriting of history and complete monopoly over the social media and the way the social media is spending you know hate distortion hate messages and then you know distortion of uh, history and then couple of more issues and then you know the kind of a fake news we have disinformation we have in the media the kind of a propaganda which is there and then complete defiance and denigration of you know parliamentary procedures by the ruling party the demonization of dissent this was not there you know, all all professors in the universities and colleges had enormous amount of freedom to write freedom to discuss freedom to debate demonization of dissent and the encouragement of vigilantism and then all of you know what's happening in kashmir now and complete battering of the constitution etc these are the issues you know which are predominantly have been figuring but did the media write about it did they have commentary about it did they set an agenda about this in that kind of a context i think you know briefly i will look at you know what what is the what is the function of the media three fourths of the indian citizens are invisible in the media that's about almost 75% of the population is invisible in india let me make my point because you know i've written down my speech the indian media is dominated by men belonging to upper classes and upper castes completely dalits and adivasis minorities and women i do not have you know any kind of a 
say in terms of writing. I made you know, some kind of an analysis. And then you know, let me give you how you know, I've in fact you know, titled my paper for this as a freedom to exclude media in India. That is the title I've given, freedom to exclude. Let me look at you know, how the exclusion of Indian media take place. The major characters of the Indian media are some of the following dimension. It is monopolistic in character, in the sense you know, that a handful of individuals, entities own and control the entire media. Today, 65 channels in this country are directly or indirectly controlled, owned by Ambani. 65 television channels. Next, the point I want to make, diversity of opinion across different forms of media is lacking since handful of individuals, entities own newspapers, magazines, FM radio channels, FM radio channels and television channels. The media today lacks social diversity in its rank in terms of people it employs. Both the management and the news department are monopolized by the traditionally privileged, dominant class or caste groups. Hindu upper caste or class men dominate the decision makers. All of you know who dominates today in terms of who are the decision makers, who are the news editors, chief editors, editors, etc. in this country. And gender bias all pervasive with women journalists continuing a small minority. Class-wise, cost-wise, upper caste predominate led by dominant groups, both in newsrooms and decision makers in media organization. The marginalized sections such as the Dalits, Adivasis, OBCs, OBCs neg negligible in terms of representation as journalists and in less lesser decision makers. Muslims are almost nearly absent in the newsrooms. Perhaps you know, some kind of a Christian representation, cosmetic representation is there. The representation of the marginalized sections such as the Dalits, minorities and women in Indian media are very, very marginal. The Adivasi representation in almost, you know, is non-existence in the Indian media. This on the basis of you know, a study which I've carried out all over the country. This is not on the basis of my own observations. I observation, Dr. Ravinder is aware of it. Indian Council of Social Science Research you know, gave us you know, big funding a couple of years ago. On the basis of that, you know, we had to look at you know, the representation of you know, particularly marginalized sections. Then let me make another point. Three out of every four authors of flagship debates, that is about almost 75% are upper caste and upper class. Not one Dalit or Adivasi or OBCs are there in terms of you know, the debate. My study also reveals for over 70% of their flagship debate shows news channels draw the majority of panelists from the upper class. I think all of you should read Akar Patel's report. I thought you know, this was my study. And all of you also read you know, Jeffrey's latest book of Modi's India. Modi's India. So when we look at you know, these factors, and what are the issues that the media is supposed to be covering? When you look at you know, inequality report, this is the latest report which has been given by Axfam. What does it say? The wealth of the 10 richest men has doubled, while the income of 99 of humanity are worse off because of COVID. Let me give another fact. The number of Indian billionaires grew from 102 in 2020 to 150 in 2022. The worst year for India during the pandemic. This was also a year when the share of bottom 4% of the population in the national wealth was a mere 6%. Let me give another statistic. In 2020, India's top 10% held close to 45% of the country's total national national wealth. A 4% of wealth tax, please listen to me carefully, a 4% of wealth tax of 98 richest families in India can take care of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare for more than two years. 
the midday meal program of the country for 17 years or you know, Samagra Siksha beyond now for six years. Similarly, estimates suggest that 1% of wealth tax on 98 richest billionaire families in India can finance the Ayushman Bharat scheme for more than seven years at the Department of School Education Literacy of the Government of India for one year. Why is that I'm highlighting this? This is the reality of India. This is the reality of India. This reality of India is supposed to be highlighted, covered by the, by the media. Before I raise one or two other issues, only 4% of the rural scheduled caste and scheduled tribe students were able to study online on a regular basis during the pandemic. Did the media write about it? Did the media talk about it? Between June and October 2020, child marriage reportedly increased by more than 33%. Now one of they say the data is 40%. And the latest disturbing data shows one third of the respondents with a ration card were unable to buy ration at a PDS outlet, public distribution outlet. As all of you know, India's public distribution outlet is one of the biggest in the country. They are getting rice at one rupee kg, but the data indicates one third of the population cannot even afford one rupee to buy rice from the public distribution uh, outlet. So when you look at you know, this data, that is the kind of a disturbing data we have. But then, I think it's important for us, as I've said, We've got to look at you know, everything from the dimension of the Constitution. Let me quote what the Constitution says. All institutions today, particularly the media, are against working. The spirit of what is the Constitution says. What does the preamble of the Constitution and director principles declare? That ours is a socialistic country, and the Constitution mandates social and economic equality to all. That is the spirit of the Constitution. Article 38.1 says, the state shall strive I'm quoting the Constitution, my dear friends. The state shall strive to promote the welfare of the people by securing, protecting, as effectively as it may, social order in which justice, social and economic, and political shall inform all institutions of national life. This is the spirit of the Constitution. Article 38.2 says, the state shall particular strive to minimize the inequalities in income and endeavor to eliminate inequalities in status facilities and opportunities, not only among individuals, but also among the groups of people residing in different areas and engaged in different occasions. Article 19b says that the operation of the economic system does not result in the concentration of wealth and means of production to the common detriment. Article 46 says, the Constitution, the state shall promote with special care and educational and economic interests of the weaker sections of the people, in particular of the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and the marginalized communities, and shall protect them from social injustice in all forms of exploitation. This is what the Constitution says. I'll just take 15 words to give my own interpretation. The economic philosophy that is being practiced today vigorously and with a great sense of pomp and pride has nothing to do with the preamble of Article 38, 39, and 14, 46. In fact, it is the exact opposite of all principles of spirit of these articles. It has gained so much of acceptance from non-poor who control political power, executive power, judicial power, economic power, and media power. The goal has been completely reversed and destroyed. And what's the role of the media? To look at what is there in the Constitution and promote you know, the 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 constitutional values. So that is where I think it's important for me to say this is the statement you know, I am I am making with all consciousness. The damage that has been done to Indian polity and Indian society is permanent now. And the present government, the Modi's performance and major issues remain mostly unexamined. Mostly unexamined. Lastly, to give you an idea about what is happening in this country, just you know, let me make you know, my statement and then you know, it will be clear for all of us. Lake you know, Democracy Index, all of your students of media. Last year we were 142, today we are 150. Among 188 nations, 
democracy index. Journalists are sedition charges are there. Journalists are killed. Journalists are murdered. Journalists are put in jail. Journalists are not even, not even allowed to cover. They, in fact, you know, brought about a, you know, a provision recently. Journalists cannot even go to parliament and cover. These kind of developments are taking place. When we talk about democracy index, they have taken all these factors into consideration. Human development index, we are very, very low. Individual rights, we are very, very low. Rule of law index, when we talk about the constitution, constitution talks about rule of law index, we are very, very low. Press freedom index, as I've already talked about, we are 150 out of 188 nations. Women's safety index, we are very, very low. Prosperity index, we are very, very low. Economic freedom index, we are low. Personal freedom, we are low. Civil liberties, we are very, very low. Only factor which we are doing very well, doing business with ease. That is the only index in India. I'm not, this is not my data. This is the data which has been given by several scholars. Then corruption index. We are one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Economic transformation, livability index, Fragile state index, social cohesion, hunger index, GDP growth, quality of nationality, smart city index. We are doing slightly better there. Sexual violence, innovation index, health index, human capital index, environment index, freedom of religion. I don't have to talk about it. I've already said the way minorities are persecuted in this country. Hard power index, soft power index, sustainability index, Moral Freedom Index, Competitive Index, and Happiness Index. I will advise all of you to read Akhar Patel. He's one of the leading scholars in this country. He's one 1,000 page book, you know, he has given evidence. Everything, you know, is given, you know, references in terms of, you know, what it has to be done. Lastly, when you look at, you know, the way the Muslims are persecuted in this country, the minorities, I've recently carried out a study and the Citizenship Amendment Bill Protection 2019 and 2020. How well on the media has covered? The way minorities are projected in this country. The way minorities are portrayed in this country. Many of them are portrayed as criminals. Many of them portrayed as terrorists. When you look at you know, Delhi riots which took place in 2020, the way media covered. And all of you know about, you know, people who have been reading Newspapers will know about Abil, how Tabilgi Jamaat, COVID-19, hotspot in Delhi in 2020, how the media covered, and then take the latest Karnataka hijab row 2022. Look at the mainstream narrative in newspapers about all this. The Prime Minister of this country talks about you know, Beti Bachao, Beti Padao. Here is a situation where you know, young Muslim girls cannot even go to a school or a college or a university. And when you look at, because I'm speaking in a university, universities are being colonized. There's no longer you no know, academic freedom which, which was there in the 60s and 70s and 80s. I'm saying this, there's a distinguished white chancellor here, particularly in central universities, what is happening, what kind of a narrative they have. Universities are supposed to be having, UGC has already given you guidelines about what kind of nature of research you know, which has to go on. In the name of national education policy, I know in terms of you know, Indian knowledge system, you know, what is happening. Several universities are introducing course, courses. Universities stand for logic, reason, debate, dissent, and discussion, and scientific temper. But universities no longer have you know, that kind of a situation. They've already, Belarus in the universities already introduced a course in MA palmistry, astrology, Vedic mathematics, Vedas, in the name of Sanskrit studies, they are bringing about you know, this kind of illogical education into universities. So my dear friends, we are going through a crisis. And this crisis has to be the role of the media is very, very significant. I had hope that the media perhaps you know, but that was the kind of a role media played in the 60s and 70s and 80s. But we no longer see that kind of a role in the last you know, 10 years, 10 years. So. In, in that kind of a context, I hope, you know, in classrooms, this kind of a discussion takes place. These kind of issues are highlighted, highlighted issues concerning the people of this country, such as health, education, land reforms, drought, poverty. What are the issues of this country? Poverty is a major issue. 
Many of you may not agree, but when you look at the latest report, 40% of India's population live below the poverty line. Look at, you know, hunger index. Several of the people, we have seen migration. We have seen migration. I filed a public interest litigation, and then I went to the uh, National Human Rights Commission. My case is pending in the Supreme Court about the, 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 the way the migrant labor, their uh, rights were violated. I never knew in this country that you know, we have such a massive migrant labor. 80% of the population of this country which is in labor force are in the unorganized sector, informal sector. 30% of them are daily wage earners. Do we have a migrant com labor commission? That was my recommendation when I argued in the Supreme Court, when I argued in the National Human Rights Commission. I said, when we have a labor department, now we have realized you know, that we have such a massive migrant labor in this country. Why don't we have a migrant labor commission? Why don't we have a ministry of migrant labor? And the media has to take up these issues. Media has to highlight these concerns. Media is just moving from one event to another event. It has to be issue-based journalism. It has to be advocacy journalism. It has to highlight the concerns of the people of this country. And the role of the media is to give voice to the voiceless. 75% of India's population today do not have a voice, voice such as the marginalized communities. The Adivasis, Dalits, women and minorities, they do not have a voice. That voice has to be reflected. And I've also raised these issues because, you know, Professor Balaswamy was a good friend of mine, a colleague of mine, and a student of mine. And several of these issues, you know, we were, we were discussing day in and day out. And I also thought the contemporary narrative of this country needs to be highlighted so that, you know, we become sensitive. That sensitivity has to be there in the colleges and universities so that we generate, you know, that kind of... A, ideology or ideas so that you know you keep reporting day in and day out. I thank all of you for giving me this opportunity. I know that uh, Professor Stevenson has set you know, some kind of a time limit before he asked me to, you know, then I thought, you know, I will highlight these issues. I wish all of you all the best, hoping that, you know, whatever we are discussing today uh, or in the classrooms, you know, we continue to report, continue to write, and continue to see that, you know, we become a just society, an equal society which Professor Balaswamy was also talking about day in and day out in the classroom. Thank you very much.